Hello, friends, and welcome back to Dividing the Word. I am Jody Williams, your host and my friend and co-host, Beecher Moorfield. Say hello. Hello, Jody. How are you, my friend? I'm great. Great. Welcome back, friends, and uh, we are still in the first part of talking about uh, the gifts of the Spirit, and uh, we have been dealing with the gifts that Jesus gives to the church. Yeah. And those are five gifts. Those are commonly called the fivefold ministry. Um, those are the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher. Yes. In our past teachings and, and, and studies, we've covered the first four, the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, and the pastor. So today we go into the teacher. And today I think will be a really interesting discussion because Right now, the teacher is, is a gift that we don't understand in the, in the modern church. Uh, we think of teachers as being Sunday school teachers uh, in the, the denomination that I was brought up in. Um, you might think of them a, as a seminary teacher or something like that, but it truly is a different gift that Jesus gave us. And so... Uh, Miss Dr. Moorfield, <laughs> to call you by your your, your uh, title that was recently given to you, um, I'd like to get you to expand on the teacher for us. Well, let's 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 go after it again. You've already shared that uh, when we talk about spiritual gifts, they they they're not all lumped together in one group. Uh, Father has gifts. They're found in Romans 12. We'll talk about those later. Mm -hmm. uh, Jesus has gifts. The ones we're talking about now, they're found in Ephesians 4. And they're also referenced in 1 Corinthians 12. And then, of course, Holy Spirit has gifts. They're the gifts of the Spirit. But what we're talking about in broadest terms are spiritual gifts. And uh, many times those two terms are used synonymously, but in reality, they're not synonymous. Mm -hmm. uh, there are there are spiritual gifts that are not even listed in these arenas that I don't know how to explain this other than to say I use the term anointings mm -hmm. when Jesus was in the earth Jesus was the apostle of our faith he was the prophet that was that was to come that had, been, that had been prophesied would come. He was an evangelist. He reached the world like no other individual could have. He was the good shepherd, a pastor, and he was rabbi, the teacher. Jesus was all five. And so today, when he selects a, uh, someone to be in one of those offices, what is given to that person is the anointing of that office. And if they'll receive it, that anointing will teach them. Mm -hmm. Again, the scripture says you, you have an anointing from the Holy One in 1 John 2, an unction. And you have no need that any man teach you, but the anointing that you've received of him will teach you. That doesn't mean we throw everybody else out and don't have anything to do with men, because he did set the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher in the body of Christ. But what it means is that where your where your gifting is concerned, and this is a universal statement now, where the gifts, spiritual giftings that are given to you or to me or anyone else are concerned with that gift is an anointing. And, I've, I, and many people will liken, they, they will try to make Holy Ghost and anointing synonymous. They're, they're not. Jesus put it this way, the spirit of the Lord, that is a definite identity there, third part of the Godhead, is upon me because he hath, past tense, he is now, because something happened in the past. What? Because he anointed me. And anointings are for a purpose. Mm -hmm. And let me just toss a name out people may know. Dino Kartsanakis, one of the finest Christian pianists that, that has ever walked on the planet. 
He's anointed to do that. That gifting that he has from the Lord is an anointing. And that anointing that is in him, along with his application of practice, of study, of learning, just like all of us should, that anointing that is in him, because he has yielded it to the Holy Spirit, has helped him to develop and taught him, brought him into the fullness of that anointing so that he, he shines right. in what he does for the glory of God. He is abiding in his calling. In his, I believe the calling of God is an anointing. The question is, what will we do with it? Hmm. So talents, like Dino has, that's a talent, is a gift of God. It's a spiritual gift. And what we do with it will determine how it is exposed through our bodies, through our work. It might be singing. Carmen is, is a prime example of that. There is an anointing on Carmen Licardello to sing, to minister in songs. And now I'm, I know I'm going back a piece for a lot of people, but there are Christian vocalists today who are anointed of God to sing. When they sing, they don't just make pretty, pretty noise. It ministers to people. Mm -hmm. I, I'm reminded of the, of the word that was given to David Ingalls many, many years ago. And he said, the Lord said to him, that as you minister in song, the anointing that I have given you will cause my power to flow out from you. Mm -hmm. See, so Holy Spirit is seeking anointings. If a person is called to be a, a prophet or a, an evangelist, a pastor, an apostle, a teacher, they, in, in order to walk in that, they first have to acknowledge it. When they acknowledge it, they begin that process of making it available to the Holy Spirit. Mm. And when it's made available to the Holy Ghost, he will come on it. Jesus said, I am anointed. I have been anointed. I was anointed. And because I am anointed and I now make that anointing available, Holy Ghost is upon me. And we saw what happened. Uh, and, and, I, I really, this is a good lead into where we are, where we are tonight, talking about the teacher. Uh, at this juncture, and, I, and I'm, I'll continue it, I've committed to the Lord at the beginning of the year to take time every day and have communion with him. And it's not, uh, it takes a while longer than it does when we do communion in church. Because I talk about every facet of my body when I talk about the bread broken, the body being broken for our healing. Man, I, I name it. I talk about it from the crown of my head, my mind, my soul, the brain as an organ, the mind as a so part of the soul. I talk about the sensory organs and, and why, they're, why they're there. You know, God gave us taste. Why? To enjoy the sweetness, the flavor, the, the goodness of the things that we eat, but also to be a warning to us of things we should not mm -hmm. allow to spit it out should not allow it to get into our system. Nasal or, or smell, the olfactory system, same thing. I'm fine. I thank God for, for the, my nose because I can smell when the cooking's going on, man. You, you can smell the rose. You can walk down, the, down a little dirt road in the country where the honeysuckles are after shower and smell the aroma. Walk by a big magnolia tree and smell it. I'm thankful to God for that. But it also warns me of fire of odors that I should not approach because there's something wrong there. So I, again, senses are, are part of God's blessing to us. And then of course, the digestive system, all the way from the teeth to the, to, to the exit from the body is the digestive system, the respiratory system, cardiovascular, the cleansing system of the liver and the kidneys. We don't think about those things. But I'm, I'm taking communion every day. And in that, I am acknowledging those blessings in my body that God made as a part of the human body. And I am already at this date. Today is what? The 12th. 12th. Today is the 12th of January. I have already begun to experience noticeable 
change in my physical body. Mm-hmm. Already seeing it. Uh, and part of that is I'm asking the Lord when I, the, when I, particularly when I take the cup, to help me to discern the Lord's body. There's more to that than just Jesus. It's seeing Jody Williams and recognizing in you what it is that God has placed in you. You're part of his body. What is your place? What is your fit in the body? What is your function? And once I recognize that, that being discerned, I then come to a place where I can honor you and the giftings that God has placed in you. Mm. We do that. Remember I, I shared earlier that you will only receive from the gift of God to the degree that you honor that right. gift of God. Well, doesn't the Bible say give and it shall be given unto you? Good right. as you press down, shaking dead, and running over shall, who is it that shall give unto you? Men. 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 I'm going to tell you what, you, th- this is not a con job. This is reality. Everybody I know is drawn to the person who rightly honors them. And many people are drawn to the people who flatter. I'm not talking about flattery. I'm talking about honor, giving honor to whom honor is due. That's a biblical command. And I'm learning more every day how to do that. I mean, this is something I've known about, but this year for me, this is going to be a year of honoring the vessels in the body of Christ, whoever they are. They don't have to be fivefold ministry. Mm-hmm. They can be the Sunday school teacher. They might be the janitor of the church. When I'm, I've, I've taken it upon myself to, to ask God to help me to discern these people with their giftings, with their abilities, with their talents, with their willingness to serve. Because when I do that, I, 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 will, I, will, I will be able to influence them more. Mm-hmm. My desire is to be able to influence people biblically in the Word of God. So we, uh, you know, didn't mean to jump into all that, but that's that is so good because you brought out the fact that the teacher's ministry, I think, and I, I think you're right in saying this, is one of the most least understood of the fivefold ministry in the body of Christ together today. Uh, let let me make one more statement about the fivefold ministry. It is the tendency of people to exalt one or more elements of the fivefold ministry above other elements of the fivefold ministry. That's wrong. That is error. Uh, There are people who call themselves apostle who aren't, but they want that title because they think it puts them over everybody else. No, it doesn't. No, no, no. I don't care if your name was Peter the Apostle. Okay, when you walked into New Life Church, when I was the pastor there, you were under my authority. Mm-hmm. Okay, I visited your hometown. I visited your the church where you attend. And when I walk in there, it doesn't make any difference what my calling in the fivefold ministry is. I am submitted to your pastor. Right. He is the authority figure there. If we're having a meeting outside the church, it may be someone else. In fact, whoever the Lord led to have that meeting is the person in charge. But outside the meeting, outside the local church, there might be apostles or prophets or, or those people that the Lord will use in giving leadership and, and process to that. If a pastor's doing his work, he will see to it that the body of Christ that under his leadership is exposed to the apostle and the prophet and the evangelist and the teacher. And in fact, I believe, can't make a doctrine out of this, but I'll still say it. I believe that where it's possible, there should be within that local body of Christ, people who are part of it, that call that church home, who operate in those five ministries, five mm-hmm. old ministry. They may not be there, or the, the apostle, prophet, evangelist, and teacher. They may not be there every Sunday, but they are connected to that body of Christ. So the body of Christ can honor that gift in safety. Mm-hmm. People come in all the time. I'm apostle so-and-so. I'm prophet so-and-so. And that prophet thing is a big thing now. I'm a prophet. Okay. I'm a shoe salesman. 
when people need shoes on their feet, who are they going to go to? <laughs> I'm, I'm not trying to be crude about this. I'm a prophet. Uh, I'm a manufacturer of clothes. When people need clothing, who are they going to go to? When the prophet needs clothes, who's he going to go to? You, you see, we mm -hmm. all have a place. It's not a big I and a little you. Right. But we're, we're, it's not about being chiefs. In fact, in the kingdom of God, the chief does the serving. Mm -hmm. Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, one is not over the other. One is not greater than the other. Each one has his place. But here's what, I, here's what I've done to people uh, in, in demonstrating this. I would hold up my hand and i say, okay, uh, you, you say the apostle or the prophet is more important, is greater than the others. And I'll, I'll, I'll just whip out my pocket knife and I'll say, which one of the other three you want me to cut off? Mm -hmm. Well, they don't want that. Why? Because they need them. This one, that little pinky right there. When I play guitar, that little pinky is just as important as any other member of that hand. Because it chords strings too. I need it. It's right. valuable. It has a role to play that fits with all the others. And that's, that's where we need to say, let's, again, let's talk about the teacher. <laughs> all right. <laughs> okay. Once again, the teacher is, is a divine calling. Uh, we're not talking about someone who takes a Sunday school quarterly. I'm not saying this to demean their work, to make light of the work of the Sunday school teacher or the daycare teacher. Or the children's church teacher, not in any way. But the, the teaching ministry of the fivefold ministry is a divinely fit, called and filled office to the body of Christ. Just as important as the other four, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. And, and one of the things we need to realize is the reason we're mentioning them in this order has not to do with their importance but having to do with their positioning and relationship. Mm. Okay. Uh, you, you could not be a professional fighter as effectively if you didn't have all of them because they make the fist. Yeah, I know they tape up the hands and all that kind of stuff. They do that to protect the knuckles and to try to keep from breaking the hand. But every digit, every one of these digits is important when you make the fist. When you're writing, people don't think about it. But when you're writing, that little finger is important because at some point, it's the one resting on the page that helps you move. And if you'll pay close attention when you write, that little finger also moves. It helps to keep the hand in that fluid motion without even realizing what it's doing. It's, it's there doing it all across the page. Each, each of them is, is important. The teacher is just as called as the apostle, just as anointed as the prophet just as special and focused in ministry as the evangelist and just as valuable to the body of Christ as the pastor. He, he has his place. He has his role. No truly anointed teacher is going to be dry. Now, people may have a bit of a dry approach. Uh, I, I'm going to say this because I honor the person. The first time I heard Gloria Copeland. I, I, I couldn't, I had difficulty receiving, not because of what she was saying, but just the fact that she was there. She was matter of fact, she was right there with it in your face, not ugly, but she was right there with it. But she was just, mm, I mean, like a race car coming by me. Mm, and the next time, <laughs> she, she was steady. She was like a rock. But in, in, a, in someone who has grown up in the preaching and spitting cotton atmosphere, mm -hmm. that seems to be a little dry. But I learned that what was perceived to be dry because of past experience was so full of the water of the word. And if you'd shut your brain up and listen to what the Spirit of God was saying, you were refreshed. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's a learning process. And yeah. today I love to sit and listen to Gloria Copeland teach. Marilyn Hickey is another one who was like that. Uh, Derek Prince was, some people said, very dry. No, he wasn't. One of the most profound teachers I've ever heard. 
but he was steady. He, he didn't seem to have the highs and the lows. He was just right along at it, which is what you need sometimes to be taught. It just over and over and over that, that same application and steadiness. And I appreciate that in people. You remember Paul said this? <clears throat> he said in the preaching of the word, he said, I planted. And what did Apollos do? He watered. He watered. He watered. The scripture shows us that Apollos was a teacher. Mm. So we need to begin to put these things together. The teacher is a waterer of the fivefold ministry. He's the waterer. Let me let me put it like this: If you were to go to a, uh, if you were to go to a, uh, what do you, herp, uh, herp, uh, the people who were plants, are they herpetologists or, or is that? Uh, no, herpetologist might be a little snake doctor. I don't know. <laughs> uh, uh, a botanist. Yes. To people who handle plants, okay. And you talk to them. One of the things they'll tell you is that one of the most critical issues once the seed is in the ground. Preparation of the ground, of course, and the seed. After that, perhaps the most critical issue is watering the plant. Mm -hmm. Don't give it enough. You'll stun its growth. Kill it. Give it too much. You drown it. Mm -hmm. You over soften the seed. It, it, it doesn't just germinate. It literally rots in the ground. It needs the proper watering, the proper amount at the proper times, in the proper manner. Some seeds can be watered just by pouring a gallon of water down beside them. Some seeds need to be watered much more gently. Right. Okay. The teacher's responsibility is the waterer. And it's, it's keenly important that they understand that and that they come with balance. They come with flow, not a gushing, you know, that just washes all the seed away. You can plant where you live. You have hills around your house. If you needed to plant grass on there, you could plant grass on it. And if it came a major rain, all your grass is gone. Yeah, stand in the road. <laughs> yeah, and and you'd have you'd have beautifully grassy curb and road corner. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> your yard would be a mud hole. So what do you do? You have to water it in a very delicate manner to mm -hmm. allow that seed to germinate, take root, to hold. Once that's done, it'll cause those rolling hills and, around your house to be absolutely beautiful with a, that green carpet. That's the same way with the body of Christ. People in the body are at different places in the body. Some people might be more on a level. Some people might be more on a slope. Some people might be down in the valley. And if a gusher comes through, those low in the valley could just get washed away and those up on the slope. So with the, the teacher is so important to, to be able to bring to the, to the ministry a level of balance. If a pastor would listen to a teacher and again, allow me to do this. Look, look mm -hmm. at, at the relationship. The apostle touches them all. Okay. Not only does the apostle touch the teacher, but the teacher touches the apostle. If an apostle would pair with the teacher and what i'm talking about here is there is some there's some sharing if you will mm -hmm. of anointing when they come together if a if an apostle would glean from the teacher his ministry would probably be longer lasting because in some things he has to do some watering too right. if the prophet would connect with that apostle who is paired, if the prophet would, you know, he's connected here primarily to the evangelist, okay, reaching the world, speaking forth, uh, forth telling concerning the body of Christ. When, when those, when that anointing, I don't want to use the term bleeds over, but when it connects, when it flows, it's like oil. You pour oil on something and it's going to get on stuff around it. Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me. When the unction of the spirit that is on the teacher gets on, gets on the pastor, it will help that pastor adjust the manner in which he waters the flock. Mm. The pastor will help the evangelist. 
That's why when an evangelist speaks in a local church, one of the first things he ought to do is to go to the pastor. Find out what the body needs because the pastor knows how do, how do we water this people? Mm -hmm. Valuable place. And again, so powerful because it's connected to this major portion of muscle in the hand that it gives tremendous strength to the hand. So again, Paul planted, said, I planted and Apollos watered. He called him the water. In fact, that's in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 6 through 9, where Paul refers to that. And even when he's anointing, and this is something we have to watch. This is why the teacher needs to be aware of that watering uh, uh, capacity. They need to be aware of, of what the people they're teaching. You can't be an effective teacher and not know something about the people you're teaching. When you and I first met, we were with the Assembly of God. Uh, I was a presbyter and I was teaching in, a, in, in Bible courses that ministers were taking to, to uh, come through, the, uh, to actually to become level, at levels of, of uh, licensure or licensing or you know, certified minister, license ordained. They were moving up the credential pathway. And we first met, if you and all the other members of the class had been 1965 model Southern Baptist, now I'm not saying this to be ugly, I've got some good right. things there, but if you'd have been 1965 model Southern Baptist, we'd have never connected. Right. Because the things I believe in, and the things that the... No, no, ain't jihad in here. Ain't going to be no tongues in this church. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and so we, we would not have connected. If I had been ministering to uh, a, 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 a another denomination, I'll just use that terminology. If I were listening, ministering to another denomination that did not believe healing as we taught, you, we wouldn't have connected. So I had to know something about the students with whom I was connected. Mm-hmm. And the student, it helps them to know something about me. Now, first time we met, we didn't know much about one another, except I knew this. I was AG. You were AG. We had a standard set of, of, of tenets of faith. We had a common ground on which to stand. So we had a point to begin. And then over time, we get to know one another better. That's, that's a part of the teacher's work, mm -hmm. is to get to know who he's dealing with. Okay, If a teacher steps into an arena not knowing that, and is not deeply dependent upon the work and of the Spirit of God in his own heart, a teacher can very easily bring division to the body of Christ. Yeah. Because they teachers typically expound in detail. They, the, in, we talk about people being expressive, expressive. You know, they mm -hmm. love to explain and expound and explain. You know, uh, I, I remember one of the first things I ever heard about sermons is that somebody told me one time said if you're going to deliver a good sermon brother Morfield and I was young and listening and he said first tell them what you're going to tell them then tell them and then tell them what you told them yep. <laughs> so it's it's it, there is a certain level of repetitiveness mm -hmm. Paul said it a good minister to Timothy a good minister puts people in remembrance what's that mean it means you're telling them what you told them mm -hmm. it's a again so the the teacher has got to be guarded that he does not bring division to the body of Christ. If he brings correction, and they are many times called to do that, he needs to explain to the people, this is correction. I'm not trying to teach you something that'll cause you to throw your pastor out or to get ugly with your church and your congregation. I'm trying to teach you something that is a level of correction into which we need to grow that brings about change in your life. It's changed my life and to help the church change. So that's the ministry of a teacher. They need to realize that, they're, that they need to be bringing in that balance. The true teacher will never try to cause division. They're not going to try it, but again, they have to guard that they don't. Another thing that a true teacher will not do is compromise. Not one ounce. Forget it. They're going to teach you the truth or they won't teach you. Right. Okay. And so the people need to understand that about the teacher that a teacher will come and say things and you think, boy, it's like getting slapped in the face with a, with a mackerel. You, wow. You, but what they're trying to do is to wake people up. 
then that that's that's the work of the teacher. A truly anointed teacher uh, is is always open to freshness from the word. Uh, you know, when I first stepped into the ministry in 1971, my function at that time was that of a teacher. And and I still have that joy and thrill in my heart. I love to read a passage that I've read before and just watch it unfold like a blossom just opening up and smell the aroma of mm-hmm. the sweetness of God like I never had before. I love it. Oh, man, I love it. But that's the role in the ministry of the teacher. Mm-hmm. Again, the, the apostle touches everything. He has to do a little bit of everything. No, no one else there. The prophet, fourth tells. Uh, again, let me quickly say, the prophet of the New Testament is not primarily a foreteller. That was the Old Testament prophet. The New Testament prophet is a fourth teller. That is, he directs people into the word of God in the direction that the Lord is designed to take the church, and it is for the edification, exhortation, and comfort of the body of Christ. That is a true word of prophecy. Uh, the, The body of Christ, I've said it before, but I'll say it again, the body of Christ and the fivefold ministry in general is so sadly short of understanding the fivefold ministry and the gifts of the Spirit Mm -hmm. that they don't know the difference between prophecy, a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge, three different. They don't understand the difference in them. Now, they're all clumped together into prophecy. Yeah. They don't understand the difference in the tongues that one receives when you're filled with the Holy Spirit Mm -hmm. and the gift of diverse kinds of tongues. The gift of diverse kinds of tongues comes only as the Spirit wills. But the the Holy Ghost, the tongues that come with the infilling of the Holy Spirit, I will pray with the Spirit. I will pray with the understanding. I will. That's a matter of my choosing. I can enter into that because the Lord's opened that door to me. But uh, I think we've, we've probably done it. I'd like, what I'd like to do is to, we've talked about the hand. Yep. But would you think this would be a good time to jump into yeah. the, how this fits in the body? I do. I want to hold this up. I, I hope everybody can see this. I'll, um, That's good right there. Okay, is that good? Okay. Yes, sir. All this is is a silhouette of the human body. And uh, I, I think you can probably see, the, the le- of course, the legs and the arms and the head uh, through the neck. Here's the body, okay? And in the, in the legs, I have some things written. There's a little dotted line across here, and there's little dotted lines here at the arms where they go out. The apostles, the Bible says that the body of Christ is built on the foundation of apostles and prophets, and the scriptures also tell us that he gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, till we all come in the unity of the faith, you know, and, and he talks about the joints of the body that brings the body, holds the body together, that supplies. Well, the fivefold ministry is a supply. Mm-hmm. And the joints of the body, whether it's the toes or the ankle or the knee or the hip, all those are joints. Some have minor action, but are so keenly important to balance. People lose their toes, they have a difficulty with balance. So they need that. Knees, try walking with your knees stiff all the time. Doesn't work well. <laughs> On gun smoke, Chester had enough problems with one like that. Okay. But, and then the hip, of course, bears the major weight of the body. Not every apostle. I'll try to hold this up where everybody can see it. Not, we'll, we'll, I want more people to see this in the light. I'm trying to get it. The, not, <laughs> every, not every apostle in the body of Christ is going to be at the same place in the leg. Not every prophet. You know, so what I've done, I've put, labeled apostles and prophets. Those are the joints in the legs of the body of Christ. All right. Then you've got the body, but when you when you want to reach out to somebody, how do you do that? With your feet and legs? No, you reach out with an arm. That's the evangelist here. He's connected to the body, but he reaches out into the world, drawing people into the body of Christ. You've got the teacher. 
the teacher is the one who instructs. Mm-hmm. As the past, as the prophet and the and, and the apostle uphold the body, that they anchor it in doctrine, they anchor it in in the truths of God's word. Then you have the evangelist that draws people into that atmosphere, into that influence. You have the teacher who gives instruction we've just got through talking about that that's why it's so detailed but then you have this little thing right here called the neck that's the pastor in the body of christ he is the one that gives mobility to oversight Mm -hmm. and you put all that together and you have a marvelous body functioning (laughs) together with of course the christ being the head with Christ being the head, the government on his shoulders. And that's why in 1 Corinthians 12, when it speaks about the pastor in the closing of chapters, verses 28 and 29, it doesn't mention the word pastor. It mentions helps, governments, Mm -hmm. and diversities of tongues. It's, It's central to the pastor's work. When, again, we need balance. If, if, the, if the joints of the left, and, and I'm just using this as, as an example, if the left shoulder, now obviously the left shoulder is connected to larger bone, ligaments, tendons, and much more massive muscle, the deltoid, the latissimus dorsi, the pectoral, the bicep, the tricep, those are powerful muscles. Much larger, the joint is much larger than the joint here. Mm-hmm. But without these, this one would lose much of its effectiveness. We need every prophet that God has. But not every prophet God has is going to be national or international. And sometimes the international ones need to shut up and go listen to some toes. (laughs) <laughs> or, or listen to some little fingers out there somewhere. You know, yeah. Because God can speak to these guys just as well as he can speak to this guy. Mm-hmm. And God can speak to the little toe, which might be an apostle or a prophet, just as well as he can speak to the international ones. See? So they, they need to be connected. They need to be working together for the same purpose. What was it? until we all come in the unity of the faith. May the Lord help us to realize the function of the body of Christ and not not honor, and again, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying this to put anyone down. I am not going, when Brother Kenneth Hagin was alive, in my estimation, he's one of the greatest prophets of his time. But, but Dr. Kenneth Hagin would not put himself in a place to be honored above a young boy out in the country, maybe 25 or 30 years old, who was faithful to God in his place, but who was also a prophet of God. Mm-hmm. He would not exalt himself over that. He would not say, look at me, I'm the hip joint. I'm the head dog in the profit agency. No, he realized that it all needed to be connected together. There, there's not a member of the body of Christ that I don't need. Hmm. We haven't done a whole lot of talking about that, about what my, my ministry is. I'll just, I hope it doesn't turn anybody off. It does, I'll just have to. My ministry is that of the apostle right now. The, the apostle plants churches, the apostle strengthens churches, teaches and, and leads, instructs, helps to grow up. The, the, he touches all those areas of ministry so that the church can be strong. That's been my work since I stepped out of the ministry, and the Lord was developing me that in that and bringing me to that for the last five to eight years of my pastoral ministry. Hmm. God doesn't just suddenly jerk somebody out and throw them over there into something they don't understand. He trains them. Right. You know, uh, Jesus spent between two and a half and three years training, not just 12, but 70 besides that and more, but specifically training 12 men 
upon whom the entire weight of the body of Christ was about to be placed for a season. One of them betrayed him. That didn't stop him from training them. Mm -hmm. In fact, they chose another one to take his place. I know ministers today who will not entertain the thought that one day they're not going to be pastoring in that church. But they will not even begin to entertain the thought of they need to pray and believe God to, for God to show them who will be the replacement here so that they can begin to train them. And the reason they're that way is because they tried that sometime in the past and they got hurt. Yeah. Somebody yeah. failed them. God help them to understand that that's not the way the Lord works. We yeah. need one another. We need one another. Every person who's watching this needs to understand that whether anybody else will ever tell you this or not, Beecher Morfield needs you. I believe you would say the same thing. Absolutely. I need Jody Williams. I desperately need him in my life. I need your family in my life. And even if I don't get to, I mean, we only really see one another now by, by Zoom. Right. I, I wish we lived next door to one another. <laughs> Me too. Neighborhood would be in trouble, but <laughs> <laughs> we, we could, well, well, never, never mind. We still need one another. We encourage one another. Mm -hmm. We strengthen one another. I'm not sure that the cell, right? Right there. I'm not sure that that cell right there is even aware of this cell's existence. Mm -hmm. But they need one another. Absolutely. They receive the same nourishment from the circulatory system. And the life of the flesh is in the blood. And it's the blood of Jesus that flows. And when a member, even one cell of the body of Christ, is cut off from the life blood, when one cell of my body is cut off, from the nourishment and, the, and life that comes in the blood that circulates through this body, that cell dies mm -hmm. and can be a real problem for other things. We need one another so desperately. Especially in these last days that we're facing. Oh, yes. There's so much work that the church needs to do and we need to prepare ourselves for it. Yes. That, and that's truthfully part of the reason we're doing this because as you said, we don't get to see each other very often, uh, about once a year. Ho hopefully, it'll be more often than that. Uh, you're in the central part of North Carolina. I'm in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia, yep. uh, about a four-hour, five-hour drive. Yep. And, and there are people who are watching us that are spread out all over the U.S., uh, some in Mexico and, and other countries. Yep. Um, so... We desperately need each other. And we won't know the full impact that we've made on the, the rest of the body until we get to heaven. And we get to see that. I think that will be part of the, uh, of the celebration and the marriage supper. That will be part of what we'll, we'll get to see is, yeah. is how something we did that we didn't even think about uh, affected other people. Yes, Yes, That'll be an awesome day. You are you are spot on on that, my friend. It's going to be a great one. Yes, it will be. Indeed. But before we get there, we have work to do. <laughs> a, a lot. Yes, a, a lot. lot. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I I strive to in no way imply that we can know the day or the hour of the coming of the Lord for the church. Mm -hmm. Right now, the body of Christ is in a is in a matter in terms of how God is working with us is a matter of process more than it's a matter of timing. I hear a lot of people talking about God's timing right now. It's it's not a matter of God's timing, it's a matter of process. The process that the church is involved in right now and should be involved in is the preaching of the gospel to every nation as a witness. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, that's when the clock starts. We know there's going to be seven years after that of tribulation in the earth, marriage supper of the Lamb in heaven, 
After that, the 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 Lord comes with his with his uh, with the body of Christ, sets up his kingdom in the earth one thousand years again, measured time. Mm -hmm. After that, a short season, unmeasured. After that, eternity, measureless. Right. Okay. So I, I don't I don't understand why people want to talk so much about time where God is concerned when we are talking about a God who is measureless who is always now. Mm -hmm. If you go back to the days of Moses, he's now. If you go back to the days of Abraham, he's now. If you come to the days of David, he's now. If you come to January 10th, January 12th, 2021, he's now. Yeah. And, uh, but right at this point of now, we're in a process. And I, 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 my, my prayer for the body of Christ right now is in this vein, one, that God would open our eyes to see that the main work that we need to be accomplishing is the preaching of the gospel to every nation as a witness. That, that's it. That, mm -hmm. that's, oper that's operative number one, coming out of the church. Be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth. You know, if, if you stop and think about it, 340 years after the flood, when God said to Noah, be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth, I, th I think it's 340. 340 years later, they, the, the people were being disobedient again. They were all balled up in one ball of wax on the plain of Shinar, mm -hmm. a place called, you, where they built the Tower of Babel. Yeah. Yep. What did Adam and Eve do when they were anything but Mr. and Mrs. Adam in the garden? What did God tell them? Be fruitful, multiply, mm -hmm. replenish. They were doing, and then he said, that's the first commandment. Then the second commandment was subdue the earth and have dominion. They were busying themselves with subduing the earth, having yeah. dominion, as were the people in the plain of Shinar. Mm -hmm. But they were doing nothing about being fruitful, multiplying, and replenishing the earth. Mm -hmm. If they had been fruitful and multiplied in the garden, Satan would have never had access because I don't believe you can be deceived by the enemy until you are first self-deceived. Mm. You hear the word and you don't do it. And that opened the door. It was their failure to comply, not working against God, but their failure to comply that opened the door for the enemy to come in and to deceive the woman. And Adam committed high treason. Yeah. Those are things that I think we need to be cognizant of today. It is the failure of the church to comply with the order to preach the gospel to every nation in, in the earth as a witness that has opened the door for so much of the deception that is roaming through it today. Hmm. You know, we're, going to, we're going to get back to the, to the primary command. Yes, we yeah, will. I better stop. We'll be here. Before. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we could be. Um, this will wrap up uh, the teaching on the gifts of the Father. Um, no, this is the gifts of Jesus. Five, four, I'm sorry. I, I said that wrong. Gifts of Jesus. Thank yes. you for correcting me. Gifts yes. of Jesus. We will get to the gifts of the Father, but actually the next step are the gifts of the Spirit. Yes. Uh, we'll, we'll go into those starting with our next uh, set of videos. Yep. So I hope you're enjoying these. Uh, if so, please uh, uh, like the video, share them with folks, and uh, of course, subscribe if you haven't already. And also leave us comments, leave us questions. We'd, we'd love to uh, address those and hear from you and, and uh, hear that, that you're learning from these and enjoying them. We, we hope that you are, we feel that you are. Um, and we enjoy do, doing them. So uh, until next time, be blessed and uh, we will see you in a couple of weeks. Amen. Amen. God bless you, my friend. God bless appreciate, you. I appreciate your good heart, Brother Jody, and, and being a part of this. You're, you're a blessing to the kingdom. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. All right. God bless. Bye-bye.